Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Ed Walter, and I'm ULI's global CEO. I am really delighted to open this discussion today about a topic that is a priority for ULI and certainly for Washington, D.C., affordable housing. Our members consistently identify that the lack of affordable housing is one of the urban challenges that's the most difficult and the most necessary to solve. So earlier this year, the Terwilliger Center for Housing released a report on attainable housing that explored the causes for the nation's affordable housing shortage and offered some solutions for that problem. So this report informed the work of a recent panel of ULI members who advised the District of Columbia on how to create more affordable housing throughout the city, particularly in the more affluent neighborhoods of the Northwest Quadrant. The panel dealt with many issues that are associated with affordable housing, ranging from raising awareness to transit accessibility to finding the land for development. While the panel addressed all these issues, I found it particularly interesting how the panel focused on what could be done right away. Because we don't want to just keep talking about this problem, we want to do something about it. And I think the recommendations that we arrived at for Washington, D.C. should be applicable to other jurisdictions. So Christopher Tomey, who's the executive director of the Twilliger Center, is going to provide us with a brief overview of the panel's recommendations. After he's done, we are incredibly fortunate to have Washington's current mayor, Muriel Bowser, and our former mayor, Anthony or Tony Williams, join our senior resident fellow, the well-known Tom Murphy, a former mayor of Pittsburgh, to discuss how ULI's recommendations could help mitigate DC's affordable housing crisis. Now, the Honorable Muriel Bowser became the first woman ever re-elected as the mayor of Washington, DC last November with an overwhelming majority vote. During her first time, the mayor took bold steps at first term. The mayor of Bowser took bold steps to expand employment opportunities, build a health care system that meets the needs of the residents, drive down homelessness, and invest in programs and policies that set up for families in need. Today, Washington, D.C. is a diverse and inclusive city, a leader in tech innovation, and a place where residents and entrepreneurs of all backgrounds can thrive. Prior to becoming mayor, she represented the fourth ward as a council member and was the chair of the Committee on Economic Development, which created more than 5,000 units of affordable housing in the district. As mayor, she established a far more ambitious goal of adding 36,000 housing units by 2025. Tony Williams served as mayor of Washington from 1997 through 2007. During that time, he was widely credited with leading the comeback of Washington, D.C., restoring the finances of our nation's capital and improving the performance of all of our government agencies, while at the same time lowering, in ta lowering taxes and investing in infrastructure. Since stepping down as mayor, among a variety of activities, Tony is a lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School, and the CEO of the Federal City Council, an organization that I'm very proud to chair. The Federal City Council serves to catalyze progress in the nation's capital by focusing on the creative and administrative talents of Washington's business and professional leaders, a number that I see in the audience today, to focus on major problems and opportunities that are facing the city. And finally, the discussion will be not moderated by Tom Murphy, who is our Canizero Klingbeil Families Chair for Urban Development. Tom has been a fellow for U with ULI for over 13 years. It's hard to detail all the number of things he's done, so I'm not going to start the list, Tom. With that, I, I really look forward to this discussion. It's something that's a real priority for ULI. So Christopher, why don't you come on up? Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Mayor Bowser and Mayor Williams, for being with us today. I uh, really appreciate the attention you're giving to the housing issue. And I uh, want to share just a few of the recommendations from the housing panel uh, that occurred back in July. Uh, as Ed mentioned, I am the executive director of ULI's Terwilliger Center for Housing, but I'm actually here today to represent the views and recommendations of the panel. And, uh, and those are uh, all contained in a report that was released today as well, and you'll find that 
in the back of the room. Uh, there are about 20 recommendations, so I'm not going to dive into deep detail on all of those, but I am going to touch on a couple in each of three buckets uh, that the panel thought were particularly important. First, a couple of just a quick snapshot of what the housing situation is in DC and what the uh, panel's assi specific assignment was. Uh, can I get a sense of how many people in the room are from the DC area? Okay, great. We have a few folks who aren't. <laughs> great. Um, so there's some familiarity with the, with the housing problems here. Um, uh, looking at affordability, if you look at home ownership uh, for the region broadly, uh, it costs, it, or the annual income needed to, to become a homeowner is about $105,000. And you can see that an electrician, an EMT, a home health care provider, a police officer, public school teachers are getting nowhere near uh, the level of income to afford to purchase a home uh, in the district. And then if you look at rental, uh, it's also shocking uh, what the affordability needs are here. We, we do see that electricians and public school teachers are at the level to afford a one-bedroom apartment, but they're the only ones uh, of those five and, uh, and certainly are going to have difficult, difficulty in a larger unit, in affording a larger unit as well. And how did we get here? Well, we had an enormous production gap from the years of uh, 2010 to 2018. There was a production gap of about 25,000 units, and uh, that started to drive prices up. And what we're looking at moving forward is a continued deficit. And by 2025, uh, that number of uh, deficit will be at 65,000 units. Uh, at current rates, we're looking at a 75,000 unit deficit as of 2030 and 115,000 unit deficit as of 2045. So you can imagine uh, where affordability will head if something is not done to address those deficits. For anyone who, in the room who is not actually from the DC area and not familiar with the geography, this is the Rock Creek West Planning District that we were asked to take a look at by the panel. Um, the mayor's housing goals were referenced and out of those housing goals, a total of 2,500 units units are targeted for this Rock Creek West Planning District. And uh, as has been mentioned, this is a very, very wealthy area of the district, and it's been a very exclusive area for a very long time. Uh, and it's not the easiest place uh, to build housing affordable to moderate and lower income folks. Uh, to give you a sense of how difficult it is, you can see where subsidized affordable housing is found in the district today, and only 1% 1, 1 is in that Rock Creek West uh, Planning District. So here's the specific assignment of the panel. First was to identify and prioritize the barriers to new production of housing, and that's both market and workforce affordable housing, to outline some specific tools and policies that could affect this, and particularly to look at zoning, to look at some uh, tools like inclusionary zoning, rental vouchers, uh, accessory uh, dwelling units, accessory apartments, and looking to fill some of the policy gaps. They also asked that we develop a strategy and timeline to lead to that production of 25 units in Rock Creek West by 2025 and ask about the kinds of typologies that would be suitable for different uh, areas of that planning district and identify uh, particular sites that might be good for housing development. And then finally, looking at the particular barrier of building sub su uh, public support for development. We all know what a challenge that can be. And uh, so the panel was asked to, to, to really take a look at that and make some recommendations, and uh, particularly to look at fair housing goals and uh, how to make the Rock Creek West District more inclusive. The, re the recommendations fell into three buckets. Uh, create more housing is really the, the whole goal, um, uh, but uh, it's built on gaining community support, improving the develop development process, and then there are several other items uh, that the panel recommended uh, with regarding to creating housing that didn't fall into those other groups. But they're all closely related, related and many recommendations uh, fit in a couple of, in, in several, if not all of the groups. Uh, first, improve the development process. And uh, one of the things that was recommended is to, to leverage small area plans, both to better engage the public and make sure that the development is reflecting public interest and concerns. And it also provides uh, that certainty around development that enables developers to come in, keep costs low, and, uh, and put units on the ground uh, at, at, a, uh, at a rent that people can afford. And uh, we also did a lot of talking about how to 
uh, how, how to reduce litigation costs and think that it's really important that the district look at things like st its rules around standing, um, making sure that folks who are suing to stop development actually have an interest in, uh, in, in, in the area where they're suing and, and the project that's being developed. Um, uh, there was also a thought of perhaps creating a legal defense fund. Uh, many times with affordable projects, there is not uh, uh, any money, really, to defend against, uh, against lawsuits. And so it's very easy uh, in a wealthier community to stop those lawsuits uh, or to stop those projects through lawsuits, sometimes repeated suits over issues that uh, had thought to be uh, addressed previously. So um, uh, having a, a, a strategy to reduce those costs would very much uh, assist. The concern, of course, is you want people to have access to the court so that their rights are defended. So if they actually do have an interest in what's going on, um, they, have, they have a way uh, to be heard. So uh, the panel definitely um, uh, uh, understands that there is a balance there, but uh, it's def the uh, legal situation is definitely stymieing residential development here. Gaining community support is a huge part of uh, developing uh, uh, residential, developing housing, and particularly affordable housing anywhere. And, uh, and there were some particular recommendations around um, race and class. Um, there is a long history of racial exclusion in the Rock Creek West District. It dates back to the 19th century, um, where you first saw the deed restrictions. You saw more informal forms of exclusion happening later. And if you look at the city today, you still can see um, uh, that the city is divided along those lines that were created by both formal and, uh, and, and informal for rules that, uh, that locked people out of the Rock Creek West area. So that, that needs to be addressed specifically, and, um, and that can both address a concern and build a lot of support. People actually don't like to have a lot of racial tension. People want to see these issues get improved. And so if you can find a way to create a conversation to make progress and show that, uh, that this is going to benefit that situation, I think you can really gain broad support uh, in the district. Um, the other thing is to, is to really be forthright and, and public about what the plans and strategies are. There was, uh, we did more than 80 interviews on the panel, and there was a great deal of confusion about what was actually going to happen to address the housing situation, and how was it going to happen. Um, so being very clear about what the ultimate plan is, is, is very important. And finally, uh, those, those additional create housing uh, suggestions were to add targeted general density. So targeted, so look at the retail quarters, the Wisconsin Avenue quarter, um, that certainly could use some retail redevelopment, and you could put housing above that. Um, general density, uh, using a form-based approach, uh, really enables you to do a lot more with a lot less impact on, uh, on uh, the look and feel of a neighborhood. Uh, there's public and institutional land in the Rock Creek, Creek West area that should be leveraged. There are libraries that could have housing built above them. There are churches and universities that have land um, that could be leveraged, particularly for affordable and workforce housing. And um, finally, I'd mention and the uh, shared equity opportunities could be a really important piece of this puzzle in Rock Creek West. Uh, this is a way to enable people lower down the income scale to become homeowners, and, uh, and that could really address some of that history of racial exclusion that has happened in the Rock Creek West area. So um, again, there were, there were about 20 recommendations overall, and uh, I encourage you to take a look at, uh, at the full report, but uh, at this point, I will hand it over to Tom and the mayors. Thank you. Um, thanks, Christopher. When I'm with my present mayor in Pittsburgh and we are speaking, we start with saying we represented two different cities. Uh, in the history from where you be when you became mayor, Tony, to where you are now is a remarkable story of resilience. I don't think, and there's a lot of young people in the room who I don't think understand I mean, I remember what this looked like around the convention center 10 years ago. Uh, and so why don't we start, Tony, give us a little sense. You're becoming mayor of a city that was close to bankruptcy. We wasn't close to bankruptcy. It pretty much was bankrupt. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we, were, uh, we, we didn't have an insolvency bankruptcy crisis on the level of Puerto Rico where you're talking about, I don't know, $75 billion on a GDP of $75 billion. It wasn't that vast, but it was serious. And so, like a state, the Congress created a control board to help all right the district. By the way, you should be a state. Yeah. Good of you. <laughs> Thank you. And the mayor, 
my organization and the other organizations and the other uh, non-government organizations in the city have uh, signed a letter supporting the mayor's effort for recognition of uh, D.C. But the long and short of it is, you know, we were able to write the finances and really get the po positive economic momentum going. It's a long story, but I'll just say that. And I think what's really happened over the last however many years it's been is, it's like when Warren Buffett talks about the power of compounding. Uh, the compounding accretive power of good government is very, very powerful. So you've essentially had a series of mayors culminating in our great mayor, Mayor Bowser, uh, good government, and good government's a good thing, and you're seeing the results of it, is what I would say. We all believe in basically the same things. Transparency, accountability, good customer service, good public safety, you know, a, a good platform of settled expectations for economic development. All these are the basic contexts for prosperity and growth. Once you have prosperity and growth, then you can talk about distribution, allocation, inclusiveness, but you've got to get the engine started. And people who criticize, and I, I, I don't want to rant, but if I could just say editorially. <laughs> right, this other mayor wants to say a few words too, right? <laughs> no, but people criticize some of the things we did to get the engine started. They say, well, you created all this gentrification. You just got to understand the city you're in. You, if you have a housing affordability problem, is it a house of, housing affordability problem uh, where some cities like John uh, Huggins, longtime friend of mine, know St. Louis, there you have a, essentially a demand problem. Key, people can't afford housing because of incomes. Or do you have a problem like D.C. where it's a supply problem? All the recommendations here go to producing more supply. This mayor gets the difference, and I'll talk about that later. Her second inaugural, she talked about that. So, so Mayor, you, you really had an opportunity to build on the foundation of good government. You've led that effort with continued good government, but you've now sort of turned the key of development here, and the, the, the amount and quality of development is remarkable Thank that's you. happened in, in, uh, in D.C., and, and yet it's not enough, it's not uh, enough. And, it's, and it's mixed in terms of, so the, ch the challenge as the ULI panel recommendations is, and you've made some ambitious, set some ambitious goals about affordable housing, so talk a little bit about generally the development that's happened under your administration and the, and the goals you have to, to broaden the, the benefits to people. Well, thank you. And I, I, I'm pleased to join uh, my Mayor Williams. And I lived in your great city for a number of years as well. And uh, we are very focused on housing affordability and the affordability of Washington, D.C. in general. Uh, where our city has come from is certainly remarkable, and Mayor Williams is humble, but has, he led a transformation of Washington with bold ideas. By the way, I just interrupt for a moment. I go to a lot of cities where a, a former mayor and a mayor would never sit together in the city. Oh, same no, city. we sit, so this we is sit self, together a this lot. Is, this is in itself <laughs> a great compliment to both of you. I was one of the mayor's original supporters. I support her strongly. She's a change agent. She Thanks. believes in her people. She's a, she's, she's a combination of someone who gets the big picture and, unlike me, I will say, is also a great politician. You know, a good politician deploying good management is a good thing, and this is that mayor. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt no, that's, your that's stuff, okay, but I think mayor, it's pretty remarkable. Bottom line, I agree with what the mayor said about getting the engine going in our city, and I tell people frequently, your city has, you, you know, you can go two different ways. Uh, you can grow and improve, or you can, or you can die. And um, our challenge is, and I'm happy to be in a position to help lead that change and transformation. Uh, I wouldn't switch places with a mayor who had the other problems of, uh, you know, losing population, losing businesses, having to cut government and, and social services to balance budgets. We're in the opposite position. So our challenge is how do we continue to manage that growth and transformation and make sure more Washingtonians can participate in the progress. So that's, that's what we're doing. Our focus uh, has been on housing, but also on how, how more Washingtonians afford housing. Uh, and you have to be able uh, to do both. Right. And, and one of the challenges, as you well know, I see the arrows sticking out of the back, your back, <laughs> is the nimbyism. Mm -hmm. Is that everybody believes that we ought to be affordable housing, but not next to me. Mm -hmm. And so, have, 
how are you dealing with that? I mean, it, that's you know, where the leadership m moment comes, sure. right? Well, when you show up at a meeting and people say, we don't want this. You bet. Um, and we have a very acute experience with this. <laughs> Uh, in that, we had a very large uh, family shelter uh, that was in a former hospital. It was too big. It was dangerous. Uh, I won't go into all of the things that, that were wrong with it. Uh, but I made a pledge that we would shut it down. Uh, and I also saw that as an opportunity for the whole city to participate in a citywide problem. So what can we do? We're a big city. We have, a, we have a right to shelter in our city. So we're always going to need emergency housing. Uh, and so my challenge to the whole city was not one area with the, the fewest loud voices is going to have to uh, shoulder the solution. Uh, so we laid out an eight-ward strategy, eight wards in Washington, D.C., to shut down D.C. General, this, this uh, this family shelter, and create smaller units, 50 units, in all eight wards. And uh, I did have a lot of bullets in my back, but we made it through. Uh, we were sued three times or four times. We won each of the suits. Uh, and we, we embraced um, council ideas uh, around it. Uh, we put millions of dollars into it. Um, but what we have now is uh, over the course of five years, we would have created shelter units for families across the district, including in this Rock Creek West neighborhood that we are talking about. Uh, and so uh, our thought uh, was that in order to ask people to be a part of a social services problem in the city, uh, we have to make it exceptional. Uh, we have to make the services rich. We have to make it fit into a neighborhood. Uh, we have to stick our necks out politically. Uh, and we have to shoulder through, even it, when it means defending ourselves against our own residents in court. Um, but if we do all of those things, align those things up together, we can be successful. And have you opened all eight of them? I think we're at four. Four. Um, and the, the one in Ward 3 in the Rock Creek uh, West area will open in 2020. Um, I'm opening one in Ward 6, uh, I think at the end of this year, and then we'll be done. You know what? They need you in Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, right, I mean, that, that, that is the same battle going yeah. on there. And so how did you manage the to move council to all agree, uh, because you have district council people, to accept um, maybe you don't want to talk about that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say this. Um, we involved them even when we didn't have to um, because a lot of the building, I, as mayor, I have the disposition of land authority. I send it to the council, and they could have been involved at the end of the process. Instead, we decided to present a piece of legislation to them at the beginning of the process so that they can weigh in, um, they can make the changes that they would be comfortable with. Um, and at the end of the day, what we got was, instead of just me being out there endorsing six sites, all 14 of us so were out there up. endorsing That's six That's sites. That's impressive leadership that you were able to get all 14. It was, um, yeah. I think we got everybody, and it was hard. <laughs> That's probably an understatement. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, as a former mayor, we love our council, right? But it's also a challenge to manage. But when you're mayor, you kind of would prefer one branch of government. Let's be honest. <laughs> we believe in benevolent dictatorships when you're a mayor. Well, right? the other uh, branches are just backup, but you know. So uh, both of you respond to this. I, I I think part of the challenge is that we're facing in the world, not just in Washington, but every place, unprecedented changes. And cities so often I see when I visit, and Tony, you've had an opportunity to visit now a lot of cities, so focused on today, just providing the basic service, police, fire, and what is, I think, extraordinary in Washington is that what you've done is taken those resources and energy, some of them, and committed them to the moral, well, one the, of the future. That, yeah, one of the things that good leadership this mayor has really done is really catalyzed, uh, I, I'll just say, Two things. One, and I mentioned her second inaugural. While not as famous as Lincoln's second inaugural, it was important. 
<laughs> because what the mayor, oh, just a joke, but what the mayor talked about, <laughs> what the mayor talked about, a lot of people didn't pay attention to it, but I did. For the first time, you had a mayor link density to affordability. Remember you talked about that? We have to talk about regulation. We have to talk about density. That's and remarkable in an inaugural that speech. Is, she's talking about sort of density. Because this mayor is about detail. That's pretty amazing. So it's important that we have a lot. That's a big conversation we have to have in D.C. where we have zillions of, zillions of square feet of FAR off the table that could be going toward affordability. This mayor mentioned that. The other thing, and starting that conversation in the right way, the other thing that you talked about here was that all the players have to be engaged. And again, this mayor's leadership has inspired uh, something we're calling the uh, Washington, so uh, Washington Housing Impact Fund, which is headed by A.J. Jackson, who's an executive with J.B.G. Smith, who uh, Matt Kelly here is the CEO, uh, partnering with something called the Housing Conservancy to essentially, uh, we've raised now around $90, $100 million that goes into creating affordability for this is complementing what the mayor's doing, affordability for middle income citizens and residents. One, and two, going out and preserving affordability before the real estate wave washes it away. So it's another thing that this kind of leadership is inspiring is that everybody talks about public-private partnerships, but here is an effective, actionable public-private partnership that's actually working and producing results. But, but it's about investing in the future. Investing that, in the future what I and complementing yeah. what the mayor's yeah. doing with low-income housing right. with middle income. Right. And I think it's important, too, um, it was mentioned earlier that we've set a goal for this region, but we are in the center of a pretty right. four million person uh, region, and we know that people cross borders all the time in search of housing and employment. So it is important that the region works together. Now, we have been uh, pretty bold because of our, our progress in the city and our prosperity in the city. Um, there's, I don't think there's another city that's putting the kind of money, public money, right. uh, towards closing gaps for affordable housing. Uh, we do, out of our, out of our general funds, uh, over $100 million a year to close gaps for affordable housing. And since this is a conference of real estate developers, yep. you might want to talk about how they might, well, how does that come together, the public and private deals come together? Sure, and it's complicated, and I like the recommendation to make these processes more simple. Okay. Um, and we're guilty of some duplicative work even in our affordable housing space, so um, we're very focused on doing that. So $100 million I put out every single year. I have a couple of agencies that the, the private development community will come and say, I have this project, um, and we can make these units available if you partner with us. Um, and we can give up a million dollars. I think one of our largest has been a $27 million um, commitment uh, to the production of that housing. What we know is when we get in, uh, then we get uh, tax credits involved, or we may get pension funds that want to invest. There are other sources that come in when the district uh, comes in as a strong partner with those affordable housing projects. And what the mayor mentioned is also important to us, where we need, uh, we need um, public support and political support for, and that's middle income production. Now, there are some people who will say, I don't want our tax dollars to be used to help people that make $90,000 a year. And that's a ridiculous statement in my view, because those same people who are making $90,000 a year who still can't afford what a market rate unit is, then they go down, uh, and now they are buying what that person who makes $40,000 right. a year could be in. Right. So we have to make sure we're investing in every segment of the, the income spectrum. I see it. I drive from Pittsburgh to Washington every week. Oh, wow. In, in Hagerstown. A lot of, a lot of driving. But I love Pittsburgh. Okay. <laughs> uh, in Hagerstown, 75 miles from Washington, D.C., yep. if I come down Monday morning, I hit rush hour traffic. Yes. And that's, and that's your challenge, is that a lot of those people that live out beyond Hagerstown can't afford to live here anymore. And so, that it's your, so the regional question of how you cooperate, I mean, you're in a unique situation 
But many but of you've those got three people, states yeah, trying yeah. to work together, right? Well, let me tell you this, because what we're finding is a lot of those people on Hagerstown and Frederick and all parts around us, um, the ones that can't afford it are moving down here because they're tired of spending their lives. Well, they're spending an hour and a half a day. Two, three hours a no, day. No, three yeah. hours a yeah. day. Just yeah. imagine how many days you're taking from your life in your car when you do that. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing that we are doing is uh, because I, I hear some from people sometimes that say, I would live in D.C., but I have kids. Right. And I tell them, you know, we have kids in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> and schools and parks. Um, but what, what they're saying in that is I want to be close to good amenities. And what Mayor Williams and Mayor Fenty and Mayor Gray before me did to our city, this is the transformation of our city, is we invested in great amenities. Uh, Mayor Williams started with our public libraries. And if you look around our city, we had the most magnificent public libraries. Mayor Fenty continued that with schools and park, parks and recreation facilities. I continue that in making sure we have the best school facilities and parks and transportation facilities um, that we can. We, all the things that the government can do, we do. So now it's not just Rock Creek West that is a desirable community in Washington, D.C. They're desirable communities in all eight wards across our city. And that's what another thing that the government does to make housing affordable. Um, we improve neighborhoods so there are more places uh, that people want to live. And so we will continue that focus. Now, what uh, eludes us somewhat, uh, or our private sector partners can help us with, is that we don't build grocery stores. Or at least we shouldn't. Uh, and we need uh, and all of those things because uh, uh, people are attracted. They have to have safe transit, schools, parks, libraries, and grocery. Uh, and when they have those things, there are more places in D.C. that they will consider living. So the, the, the relationship, mentioning transit, metro, in one way when it's created one of the most remarkable developments in America of three, th three states, I'll give State you that, Thank you. coming together, agreeing to how to pay for it. And, and now more recently, the challenges of not only trying to maintain it, but also the discussion of potentially expanding it. And how, how is that conversation go with two governors and yourself? You, in effect, are playing the role as governor uh, and mayor of how, how do you work that out? There's been bumps in the road, yet we see Metro beginning to expand toward that. Uh, Dulles and uh, and so. Well, I think we had, and Mayor, you probably will agree that we had a big triumph uh, in bringing our three jurisdictions together for Metro. I firmly believe if we allow our Metro system to slide, it will be one of the, the biggest thing that drags down this region as a competitor right. with other regions. Right. And it is, it's not. Um, it's not possible for us to let the metro slide. So we came together, I think, with a historic funding agreement. I want to thank many members of our business community uh, who have, have been helpful. One of the biggest challenges is, you know, in D.C., we're committed to transit. We're urban-focused. We have a great system. We want to get cars off the road. And I don't know that there has been a, a mayor, in my experience, that differs from that point of view. Uh, or that there will be a, a chief executive in our future that would differ from that point of view. It's different in Maryland and Virginia. Uh, they have a bigger, uh, they have constituencies that love roads uh, in parts of their states. Um, and then they have constituencies that are closer to us uh, who value transit. Right. So it, uh, it makes it a little bit more difficult for those governors, but not impossible. Uh, they have the resources to invest in transit, uh, and they have to be committed to it. And so they, it, it, you've built, a, I mean, there's some relationship now putting money in for maintenance, and it's, it's beginning to well, We raised uh, the Absolutely. leadership of the three governors. Uh, we led the Federal City Council. We led an effort of uh, the regional organization support them uh, over uh, a 10-year period, 15, I forget it now, 30-year period. I'm getting my numbers mixed up, but $15 billion to go into a capital plan for Metro. So this is a big commitment by the three states to go into. Yeah, it's a, it, and so you get credit for helping to negotiate. Right. That. And the second aspect of that was better, where we thought it was condition proceeding, but it's kind of trailing. But it, as long as it happens, was better management as well. And the mayor has led the effort in appointing uh, uh, who acclaimed former uh, director of DMV, deputy mayor, 
to now be her representative on Metro. So she's taking seriously professional qualifications on the Metro board. You know, we're not like doing an opera here. We're trying to run a transit system, so. And, and I almost hesitate to ask your relationship with the federal government. Mo most of us ran cities. We, we were creatures of state legislators, which was in many ways difficult enough. I can't conceive of having to go to the federal government to try to run a city. Right. Um, so, so maybe you don't want to. No, it's fine. We talked, to, we talked about it a lot, and I know that Mayor Williams shared this view that uh, we're going to work with all of the people that we have to work with, whoever's in Congress and whoever is in the White House. Um, and we're very aggressive about those relationships. Uh, it would, we would be helped by two senators. So that's why statehood is so important to us. Right, 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 um, right. And you talk about Metro. Uh, just imagine um, when our, you know, our senators are going to get something for Metro. And by the way, I'm, we're the biggest payer for Metro. By far, you know, we pay more than the states. We have more service uh, in our city. Uh, and being a part of that compact is very important uh, to, to our future. Yet, uh, we have to rely on the senators from Maryland and Virginia when it comes to getting the fair appropriations from the federal government that we need for Metro. And so you're, I just heard you're expanding the H Street H Street Streetcar. We will. And, and that's been very successful, the part that's... It's been very successful. It has a long history. There will be many people in this room that won't agree um, with, with the H Street. We had a billion dollar plan for a streetcar. Now we have a one line plan for a streetcar. Uh, we are really putting our eggs in the basket of a bus and how a dedicated bus can uh, help move uh, people through our city. So you're going to create sort of the BRT model and more and more? We are going to, uh, we have a big proposal, and we want to thank the business community for their support uh, so that we can get it back on a timeline that I had proposed a, for a K Street transit way. So if you spend any time on K Street, you know we kind of have these weird service lanes. Right. None of it works, not deliveries, not pickups, not bus, nothing is working. And so we have a pretty big uh, proposal to transform K Street so that it's working better for all modes. So to switch signals now, you mentioned the business community a number of times. You've built a good partnership. It seemed, I, I had an opportunity to, to be a moderator of a panel a few uh, yesterday with, uh, uh, with a business leader group in Washington, they, they are really seem to be, you have a great partnership there. Again, I see in a lot of cities that relationship often doesn't work well between the elected officials and, but it, it, you might want to talk a little bit about how you've nurtured that and maybe Tony, how you, you helped to, to begin to build that. Well, I uh, run the Federal City Council, which is an organization y'all should know was started about six, is headed up our chairman now. Ed Walter, head of ULI, is our chairman of Federal City Council was started by Phil Graham of Washington Post fame, who was a big player in national policy and felt that there needed to be in the 1950s something like the Allegheny Conference in Pittsburgh where the biggest players could tackle the biggest problems, where they could make the biggest difference with the biggest impact. And so if they couldn't really make a difference, they didn't want to be involved. But over the years in the creation of the Metro, revitalization of Pennsylvania Avenue, Union Station, now the Cap One Arena, major initiatives, ec education reform with my successor, Adrian Fenty. We were there playing a, a big role in the non-governmental sector. And we've now played a bigger role. We never were really involved in district uh, public affairs uh, per se. We wanted to be kind of on the QT. But you know, the former mayor is the CEO. It's kind of harder to be on the QT. So we just said, hey, whatever. So now we've gotten really actively involved in more public affairs in the district, supporting the kind of sensible, social, social responsible, economically feasible uh, public policy that this mayor is uh, about that we're strongly uh, supportive of. Because the, last thing, the first thing we want to do is support what I always call the right kind of context for investment. Without investment, as a mayor saying, nothing else is going to follow. So we're about creating settled expectations, the right climate for investment, supporting her in what, in what she does. And I would say, including my time and my successors, I don't think we've had a better relationship between a mayor and the non-governmental players 
uh, than we do now. And how do you nurture, nurture that? How are you, do you meet regularly with a business leadership groups or, and work out an agenda? This is sort of where I'd like to go and, and, they, and have that conversation. I do, um, and I also see it as my role um, in, in leadership because I think there's a lot of re rhetoric permeating our public policy discussions nationally and it's, um, it's, it's locally affecting us too. Uh, and that is this kind of tendency to pit the business community against the community. Uh, and I, I do everything that I can to, to tell and support and explain um, all of the initiatives that we engage with the business community in to communities all across the city that we need each other. This is a symbiotic relationship. The business community develops the amenities that you want, hires DC residents, uh, and is supportive uh, in making sure that we have a diverse economy in the district. Last thing we wanna be uh, is a one company which is the federal government right. town. Right. Um, because what has changed in our economy over the last 15 years is that we have been able to attract private industry, that we have been able right. to become known as a tech employer. We have become known as a place where you can start a business. And that is very important to us. So it is a, it's an ongoing process that I probably learned as a, a ANC commissioner, uh, an award council member, and certainly now as mayor, as I have a role um, in making sure that this relationship, community to business, um, is in, is 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 workable. So we uh, we have a number of organizations. I went around on a, a, a tour of all of our organizations a couple of years ago to say, hey, get in the game, um, and say we need you leading on on policy. We need you ahead of legislation that's that's going to hurt our ability to recruit new businesses and retain businesses. Uh, we need uh, your executives to be thought partners with us on some of these tough questions. Uh, and I think by and large, we, we have people always willing to roll up their sleeves and, get, and, and help out. So let's, we have a few minutes left. Let's, we'll happen to open it up for questions. Is, are there, there's microphones here. If you have a question, please go up to the microphone. Don't be shy. You're a shy group. Mm -hmm. Well, go up to the microphone, please. Okay, Ray. Uh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your time. <clears throat> I'm a native of the area, and um, I own and live in the H Street area. And um, I'm also a realtor in the city. And so I'm very curious about the, um, how this business and public partnership relationship is going to work to push more retail and office to east of the river. Um, I, I heard Jerry Lynch say a few months ago that um, development won't really happen there until the incomes rise. But as you know, the incomes aren't going to rise until the jobs. So um, sort of what's the plan for getting um, development kind of off of H Street and over to the river? Thank you. So thanks for that question. And uh, we've, we've done a couple of big things. And uh, we do think that incomes will rise and we will uh, be able uh, to uh, retain housing and opportunities for people of all incomes. We see the interest uh, already kind of rising uh, in that area. Uh, we've done a couple of big things development-wise uh, at the St. Elizabeth's campus. The district was first in uh, in building uh, our sports and entertainment arena. And now we see the development proceeding all over that arena, which connects it to a very important metro node. Uh, you probably heard the announcement that I am refocusing our government leasing east of the river. And uh, that is... That's going to be, everybody's going to have to get used to that idea and how we are pitching it uh, and how we're going to be able to support daytime traffic with, uh, with D.C. government jobs first. And so, so that's very important. The other thing is that uh, we continue to make, as I said, amenities east of the river uh, and make investments uh, in, in those amenities east of the river. So people will have a sit-down restaurant. Uh, they will be able to use transit and use free circulator and all of those things. Um, and something near and dear to Mayor Williams' heart uh, is we continue to focus on the public spaces there on the Anacostia River. 
uh, in, in, in a very short few years, Mayor, we're going to have a swimmable, fishable Anacostia River. <laughs> now the, uh, the legendary uh, American shot has come back to the Anacostia, which is a real bellwether. The river is, because of, again, a succession of mayors staying on it, is, is getting cleaned up, so it's really remarkable. And that's where I met uh, Mayor Williams um, around rivers and development um, originally. Ray. A few rivers. We had, we had rivers that caught on fire, as you remember. <laughs> well, on behalf of us, uh, with ULI, thank you both for coming. It's very important for the organization like this to have really distinguished leaders like you contributing to our, to our focus here. Uh, just I, I, in, in 40 some odd years in development, the first time I ever heard the term gentle uh, zoning. Me either. Uh, so I would just like to, to pose the question, how about a little bit more aggressive zoning up the main avenue corridors into the uh, Rock Creek West areas, whether it's, you know, you go to West Western Avenue and we develop buildings in Montgomery County that are 15, 20 stories, and across the street you've got a three-story three uh, mall with Mazza. Uh, how about areas like Georgia Avenue, Wisconsin Avenue, Connecticut Avenue, where you can bring residential density in much greater uh, uh, sizes and address affordable housing that way? Thank you, Rick. You know, the mayor is actually, you know, with the affordable, with the uh, ending homelessness plan, you know, started that conversation in Northwest. I remember during my time, I would have the conversation when we during the first, well, whatever our iteration was of the comprehensive plan, and the uh, people came in talking about more density on Wisconsin and Connecticut Avenue. Now, I can say this now because I'm no longer in office. So, you know, if you go to the people in Northwest and you say, are you, you believe in a healthy environment? Yes. You believe we ought to combat climate change and global warming? Yes. You believe in smart growth? Yes. You think that every city should play a part? Yes. You think density is a big part of this? Yes. You think we should have more density down the street? No. That's the problem. Everybody kind of gets it in the general when it's getting them to focus on the specific, how it relates to that broad issue in affordability. Uh, but the mayor, you started the conversation. I give you credit for that. I think, uh, Ray, we have to, it, it's, uh, it's going to take more than us and the Office of Planning and our housing agencies because we can start the conversation in advance of a big idea discussion, but we have to have some support from our policymakers on the council. Uh, and so we have to push people beyond this idea that a committee of 100 people should outweigh the, the needs of uh, housing for this generation and the next. Uh, we have to get people to think, and this is where I've always approached, whether it's a transit project, a development project, or anything. I, I um, approach it thinking that it's a 50-year project. And I think if people could approach it like that, they could get themselves, I'm talking about policymakers now, because they have a leadership responsibility. They can get themselves out of this idea that this is going to affect neighbor X, Y, and Z. But the truth is, neighbor X, Y, and Z probably won't be there in 20 years. And um, when I was campaigning, I, I have this example. We, we were, you know, was my first campaign, I think, and I'm walking, I'm knocking on doors, and I'm going down the sidewalk, going to the next house. And then I come to this patch where there is no sidewalk. And then beyond this house, the sidewalk starts again. So you know what happened there. We have this thing about sidewalks. Some people don't like them. Somebody said, I live here, and I don't want a sidewalk. That person was probably long gone by the time I came by to knock on that door, but still we have no sidewalk. So it was just a very simple illustration to me is how one person can't affect the infrastructure of a city for 50 years. And so I think if we have that approach when we go uh, into some of these discussions, we can get people um, out of this. The second thing I'll say about that is you have to give people real finite um, targets that they can relate to. So I'm not going to go to Rock Creek West and say, hey, I need you to help me afford, you know, solve the affordable housing crisis. We have, to, we have to come up with another way to explain what we're doing that they can um, embrace, or at least if they don't embrace it, they will look shameful. 
<laughs> that's a good. That's a good. Okay, so you we we have to we have to say we have to give people a mission that they can embrace or be called out. Um, and they have to explain why they're, they're not behind this very good thing for all of us who live in the city now and for the next generation of people uh, who will live in the city. Um, people will, you know, will rationally pursue their own self-interest. We know that. Uh, and that is why we have a government uh, to come to collect uh, the, you know, the collective um, good for all of us. And you're going to push me, everybody. We're going to push the council. We're going to push the zoning commission. We're going to push the land use attorneys to make sure they're getting it right. All of us have, uh, have a role to play in making sure we're advancing a good project. But then we have to deliver on it. I think you're we're going to you're gonna get the last word. Go ahead. So uh, why don't we introduce yourself? That's Robert Goldman, Montgomery Housing Partnership. And so I want to commend the mayor on her leadership on affordable housing. And, uh, and I think it, sort of to, to what you were just saying, your effort on affordable housing to get to 100 million, now 115 million, that not only impacts your district, but it also helps us in Montgomery County to do what you just said with Ward 3 is then to shame our, our members of the council and county executives say, if the district can do 115, why are we only doing million. $30 million? <laughs> exactly. I agree. Exactly. So I appreciate your leadership on that and your, your willingness to put targets. And, I, I, you know, and so I guess what I would say is what more can we do on a regional basis to get the leadership that you have here to get more affordable housing to, within the other jurisdictions so we're all kind of doing the same. So any more suggestions you have? Thank you. Well, you, you may know I'm a big fan of Montgomery County. I've worked for Montgomery County for 10 years. Montgomery County has been incredibly good to me. Um, and I have been kind of watching some of the reporting around the housing itch, issues in the county. And they seem to be uh, more linked than ours. They seem to be linked to schools. So I think some of a uh, way to, to get people comfortable with more housing units, especially in areas um, where the school populations are big, is to also talk about schools. And because if you're, you're having school, we, we made big investments in schools, and we're going to continue to make huge investments in schools. And I don't, I don't know if the same is the, if it's the same in the state. So I would um, continue to think about how you link schools uh, to that discussion. Because nobody wants, if, they can, if there is an issue that people can get behind, instead of talking about the real issue, they will. So eliminate school crowding or those types of things as an issue or an impediment to talking about housing and more housing units. I think it's in the interest of the counties to really work with the city because we, one, are a metro region competing in the global economies. It makes sense to reason that metro region competing in the global economy, we're going to be better off with six senators rather than four. This is like, duh. We're going to be better off with a better workforce that's more mobile. This goes to affordability, transportation, all these different things. We're all in, and it's in the, it's in the interest of the county, counties now to talk to the district because what this mayor and future mayors are struggling with is keeping the city, if we were trying to get the city going again, now mayors are struggling to keep the city inclusive and affordable because the mayor would agree with this. If you took your hands off the controls now, in 40 years, the district would essentially, be, if all the uses expire, the district would become a European city and we'd be like a European city where the center core was doing fine and the inner ring was struggling. Now's the time to address those issues. That's what this mayor's saying. So we have a minute left. Mm -hmm. What's the future? What do you see that we don't right now over the horizon as sort of the big issues? And Tony, you're sort of the senior guy. You've had an opportunity to, to spend a little bit more time looking, trying to look over that horizon. You're trying to run the ship every day. But mm -hmm. what do you see coming uh, in terms of the challenges for cities like Washington? And, and you really are an international city in that regard. I think we have a challenge with um, we're, we're going to run out of space 
to, to build housing. And so we have to look at our unused space. Um, and it's, it's a tricky conversation in our city because we have a lot of density outside of our monumental core that could be taller. <laughs> say that. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, and I also think there's a challenge out there kind of in the industry of helping us come up with ways to build affordable housing more uh, that doesn't cost so much. I mean, the subsidy required to get affordable housing units is astronomical. Um, so what industry uh, can you help us with to make the best use of our land and the best use of our subsidy? So we hope technology and housing production. Yes, and we've, we've seen cheaper. some of that. We, we, for example, a couple of weeks ago, we were having a unit, uh, a building convert from one bedroom units. They're going to turn them into two bedroom units and use a service to put roommates together, basically. So now a unit that was going to house one person is going to house two people, and it'll be more affordable somewhat um, for, for, for those people. So there are going to be a lot of things that, that we have to do to house more people in the city. Thank you. Tony, do you have a... Yeah, for you know, 60, 70 years now, it's been a big topic in academic salons and corridors to talk about who rules the city. Now, you all as developers, it's, you know, the common uh, premise has been that the developers have this cabal and they're ruling the city. I think the question has to be raised now going forward when we ask who rules the city, because that notion that you all are running something has been debunked. If you know an American city, it's hard for anybody to run the city, let alone a little cabal. But the question has to be raised, are the people running the city now, or at least the people with an undue influence now, a small minority of people who fancy themselves to be the defenders of the public, republic against the hordes? You know, a minority of small people who are sending every good architect to their death, who are dooming every development to unterminable delay for year after year after year, are they the real culprits? The question ought to be raised. In the coming years, that's a big issue. That's a great issue of how we govern ourselves. And with that, I want to thank all of you. But let me just say one thing. I'm going to tell you a secret. The best job in America is being mayor of your city. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay.